Good evening, everyone. My name is John Tibbetts, and I'm the assistant director here at the Chatham Historical Society, home of the Atwood Museum. And we are really excited for tonight's speaker, uh, Peggy uh, Jabolinski. Uh, first, I'll just do a quick few housekeeping items. Our next lecture will be April 12th with Ingrid Stephenson. And that lecture is called Solving for Alice. And that lecture is about Alice Stalnick, who is the painter of the murals in the mural barn. And we are doing a new exhibit on uh, other works of hers that will open in May when the museum reopens. We have two other new exhibits coming this year, including the Clubs of Chatham, A Century of Summer Leisure, and Weird, Wacky, and Wonderful, Curiosities from Our Collection. And that is a mix of various things that we found in our collection that spark wonder and kind of make you question, why did they end up here? And what is their history at Chatham? And now for Peggy, Peggy Jabla, um, excuse me, <laughs> Peggy Jablowski has uh, conducted tours throughout the Cape and about 28 in 2021. And they focus on social justice and the history of Cape Cod. So now I'll turn it over to Peggy and we'll go on from here. Okay, John, thank you so much. And thank you everyone who's on screen tonight uh, joining us from Cape Cod and uh, from many other places, I think too. So uh, thank you for taking time to spend with me and with each other to take a long walk around Cape Cod. So what I intend to do this evening is take you on some of the walks that I did over the course of the summer of 2020. Uh, and I'm gonna do that by sharing my screen with you and going through a presentation. And I'll stop about halfway through and ask if there's some questions at that point. And then again at the end, and we can have um, a bit of a conversation. So feel free to put a question in the Q&A or um, I think in the chat, but that will be looked at. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and presentation. If uh, John, if there's any issue and people can't see it, let me know. Everything so let's good. go ahead and get started. Um, I have worked in higher education for almost 40 years and at a variety of college campuses, including MIT, Brown, BU, uh, and I currently uh, am adjunct faculty at Bridgewater State. And I do some mediation and leadership coaching and run retreats. And I created this Camino Way, Cape Cod Walks with a Purpose, really came together out of, as I say, a convergence of two pandemics that hit us in 2020. And that was the COVID-19 pandemic that really came full force at us uh, March, April, May of 2020. And we had to think about rearranging every aspect of our lives from work to school to our healthcare, uh, travel, everything. Um, and then the impact of the murders of many uh, Black people around the country, and in particular, the impact that um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor had on me in terms of, you know, attending some um, vigils and getting to understand more about why their lives were taken in the ways that they did. And so out of these two converging pandemics, I realized that I was not going to be able to travel. Um, and I usually travel out of the country at least twice every year. I'm a dual citizen with Ireland. And I had wanted to travel the Camino de Santiago in Spain, the Camino Way. Some of you may have walked it yourselves or heard about it, that there's these various routes that converge at Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And it's a ancient pilgrimage route uh, that hundreds of thousands of people still walk every year. And so what I just, a pilgrimage is really um, an opportunity to pause, slow down, take a journey both inward and outward and 
really look at things around you and within you. And so because of the pandemic and all the racial injustice that was going on, I decided that I was going to take the concept of a Camino way and put it as an overlay to Cape Cod. And so I said, I live in Brewster. I'm going to start at the bridges at the canals and walk through every town. I'm going to touch every single town on Cape Cod over the summer of 2020. And so I started walking around the 4th of July and I would walk every Wednesday between 12 and 15 miles. And I would map out the walk in advance and give it a theme based on what was going to be on the walk, but also weaving in issues of the environment, uh, the economy, um, women's issues, uh, our founding documents. And so what I'm going to do now is take you on a quick tour around Cape Cod and you'll see um, how it played itself out, some of what I found. And I really want to try to encourage all of you to, con to look at history in a way that applies to contemporary issues today. And so you'll see several of these examples as we go along. So let's dive right in, put on your walking shoes and join me. So here I am, the first walk at the 4th of July week was an introduction to all the issues around uh, social justice on Cape Cod. And I walked both sides of the canal, which ended up being 13.5 miles. And what I did was I actually took the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and read parts of it. This day, about four or five people walked with me. And we were able to pause, inquire, listen to the quotes from the Declaration of Independence. So for one example, Native Americans are described in our Declaration of Independence as, quote, merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an indistinguished destruction of all ages, sex, sexes, and conditions. Well, I, I was an American history major undergraduate at college. I never remember hearing something like that in the Declaration of Independence. And then we looked at the Constitution of the United States and the whole issue about all men are created equal. Well, in 1776, the term men, as we know, included women. And by extension, it also included um, anyone else, enslaved, uh, Native Americans, et cetera. But to say that everyone was equal at that point clearly was not true because even across genders, women had no property rights, no voting rights, et cetera, et cetera. So we walked both sides of the canal really deconstructing a little bit what our documents really say and then why they still are such um, kind of a thorn in the side sometimes because people are using them maybe inappropriately. Um, and so let me, I do see a hand raised. I'm gonna go two or three walks and then we'll take a pause and answer several questions together, okay? Um, so the second walk was, I'm sorry, did I? There we go. Walk number two was from uh, Falmouth to Woods Hole, mostly along the Shining Sea bike path, about 12 miles. And this week we focused on women and people of color in science. So as many of you know, uh, Woods Hole is filled with amazing institutions and organizations like Woods Hole Oceanographic, NOAA. Um, and I was able to interview 
several women scientists, three of them are in this picture on the bottom right, and they joined our walk, as well as there's two girls from Falmouth High School who are very interested in science, and they joined our walk. And here we gathered on the Falmouth grain in front of the Kathy Lee Bates statue. And so this walk was interesting because it highlighted two of the three statues that have are attributed to or are, are honoring women on Cape Cod. So first one was Kathy Lee, Kathy Lee Bates, who wrote the uh, America the Beautiful. And what I did was, again, a lot of this was just by Googling and looking up websites, looking up museums like the Atwood. And so what I found when I looked at, well, who was Kathy Lee Bates? She was a professor at Wellesley College. Her hometown was Falmouth and she traveled across the country and she wrote America the Beautiful, I think and when she was going over the Rockies in Colorado. And the final, it was written as a poem and the final stanza of the original poem reads, quote, America, America, God shed his grace on thee till nobler men keep once again thy whiter jubilee. I didn't understand what that possibly could mean back, I, I, I maybe made a, uh, an assumption about what it might've meant back then, but in terms of what happened to that, that stanza was dropped when the poem became the song, America the Beautiful that we love and sing. And so it caused us to think about how, how some of our foundational, you know, songs that we are, um, that are about America, maybe have at its roots, a meaning about keeping America white or a whiter Jubilee. Again, I had to think about what did that possibly mean? And then I Googled and found the version that the cast of Hamilton sang. And so I would encourage you to do that on um, YouTube and you can see what their version of the language is. And we walked over to Falmouth and along the way, oh, I'm sorry, we, we focused in on women in science and had a lot of quotes from the book Braiding Sweetgrass, which I highly recommend to you. Braiding Sweetgrass is by Robin Wall Kimmerer, and it's about indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teaching of plants. And so Robin does a great job at weaving in nature and indigenous uh, knowledge as well as scientific knowledge for us. We also found the second statue of a woman over in Woods Hole, Rachel Carson, who many of you might know was very connected to the environmental movement. So this was a great day to just focus on inspiring young women to continue to focus around careers uh, on, in science. The third walk was around, we focused around the Wampanoag experience because we started at the Mashpee Wampanoag Museum, which is right here. And there's a We Too out back and a canoe. And even though the museum was closed because it was COVID, we were able to talk through the connections. It, we were celebrating the return of the uh, Mayflower over to the, the replica of the Mayflower to Plymouth. And so I started thinking about, well, what, did, what, did, what was it really like for the Wampanoags to have the pilgrims arrive and get off the boat in Provincetown, not Plymouth as their first location, and wander around Cape Cod for about a month and then create their uh, permanent um, 
permanent uh, location over at Plymouth Patuxet. And so we talked about uh, the 400th anniversary and what did that really mean today, given that the Mashpee tribe was still trying to get appropriate federal recognition for their land. Um, and so we talked also about, we walked through Mashpee, Osterville, Centerville, Marston Mills, and Hyannis. And I'd like to point out that this group of people in the bottom right is my family. And you can see that there's um, a woman of color. My sister-in-law is from Trinidad and my niece uh, in front here with my brother. And many of us were wearing the t-shirts of the Cape Cod Camino Way, which had a clam shell, which is a Native American symbol, the Wampanoag symbol. And while we were walking through, here's another picture of several family members and walkers, while we were walking through, it was either Centerville or Osterville, we were actually racially profiled as a group. I didn't realize it was happening at the time, but my brother became aware of it, that we were being followed and then asked, what were we doing there? To me, this is a pretty unassuming uh, group of mostly women, but there were two people of color in this group. And I'm not sure if it was just a group of all uh, white people that we would have been stopped and asked, what were we doing on a public road? And so my brother shared some stories, my brother and sister-in-law about how that happens to them all the time, that they're made to feel uncomfortable about where they are. And that just made me feel terrible. And I had to process that with them that evening. We did get to go to the Zion Union Heritage Museum, which is in Hyannis, and had a talk by Pamela, uh, Pamela Purrington, Chatting, Chatterton Pur Purdy, sorry, Pamela Chatterton Purdy, who's the creator of these icons of the civil rights era. And you'll see them all along the walls in the Zion Museum. This is a fabulous, completely underutilized, um, not well-known museum of Black and Cape Verdean art right here on Cape Cod. So I highly encourage people to take a look at that and understand about the, um, the background that many of the people of color bring to their artwork and the stories that can be told through art. I'll do one more walk and then we'll stop for a few minutes and, and talk. So the fourth walk was all up um, the historic district of 6A from Barnstable Yar through Yarmouth and through Dennis. And this was a very rich walk. You'll see this picture here, our third statue of a woman, Mercy Otis Warren who actually was one of the most influential writers. Uh, in today's parlance, she would have had her own blog and podcast. She interacted with everyone from John and Samuel Adams to George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. She was influential in helping create the Bill of Rights. And we, we don't know about her in our history books like we do the names of all those other people that I just mentioned. And so I stopped in front of her statue and read from some of her writings um, that she did back in the uh, late 1700s, 1770s, 80s, etc. And we talked on this walk about the summer versus the year round economy on Cape Cod, the economics of it, because we were going by the, the um, the jail and the courthouse, we talked about policing and what was going on around the country and on Cape Cod. And we also went to the Taylor Bray Farm, which has a current exhibit around an excavation of Native American artifacts. And we stopped at the Association to Preserve Cape Cod, which is all about the environment and had a nice conversation there. 
And then right next door to that is capabilities, um, which provides an outlet um, for developmentally disabled folks to work and learn and study. And so this was a really rich, um, for those of you who've gone up 6A, you know that it's just filled with all kinds of historical artifacts and uh, statues and markers, et cetera. But there's all these organizations there on 6A too that have so much to offer us. So let me stop here. And I'd love to have any questions or comments both about how did I start this or any of these four walks from the canal towns, Falmouth, uh, Hyannis, all the way up to now we're in uh, Yarmouth and Dennis. So let me stop there. And if John, you want to try to help out with. Sure. Yeah. So one, it's um, one question they wanted you to kind of go back and kind of explain when you were talking about in the 18th century, the quote, all men are created equal. We do know that Abigail Adams had reached out to John saying, remember the ladies. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think just kind of elaborating that concept of what all men meant, and clearly it's different than our contemporary kind of understanding of that. Right. Um, so most of our, uh, much of our literature and our documents like the Declaration of Independence or the Federalist Papers, the Constitution, they use the term men to include all people. Um, we have gotten away from that, I'd say in the last maybe 30, 40 years. And so we try to use more neutral language. You might, it might say men and women, or it might just say, the people um, or the community or something like that. What was maybe particularly pernicious about when we think back of, of this, here's a group of colonists coming together. They're all land holding wealthy white men writing the Declaration of Independence to say that all men are created equal. Well, even all men were not created equal because there were no people who didn't own property, who weren't wealthy, who were part of that group who wrote that document. And if you were a black or brown person, you were either, if you were black, you were most likely enslaved. And if you were Native American, you were most likely, um, you know, socioeconomically disadvantaged and constrained about where you could live or what kinds of jobs you could have, etc. So I hope that under and that doesn't preclude people like Abigail Adams, who I absolutely adore and think she, I mean, she carried she carried the day. She ran the farm. Uh, while he was away, she she was the you know the main uh, merchant uh, in her family, and she was the educator of their children, and she did keep basically hounding her husband to remember the ladies. So that was very true that she did what she probably could do, given the circumstances of the times. Interesting. Thank you. Another question says, what type of support did you receive during walk, your walks, like positive feedback? And then did you receive any negative feedback on the walks um, or any people you kind of encountered while walking? Sure, great, great question. So um, none of this could have been happen, ha could have been possible without some logistical support provided to me, um, which happened through family members and some friends. There was one woman whose picture you will see a few times who walked all eight walks with me. And so she and I would partner up and figure out our rides and food and, and how to you know, manage the logistics on this. I also received you know, some, some help from people like WCAI interviewed me, um, the Cape and Islands Radio, 
uh, the Barnstable Patriot, the Cape Cod Times. So there was some advertisement of this going on. And over the course of that summer of 2020, I think 43 different people walked with me and at least a dozen of them walked on two or more walks. So that was really powerful to, I mean, I literally just started this you know, out of thin air, and then each week would post it on Facebook where we were going to meet, where we were going to be halfway through. And then um, I would post pictures and our lessons learned. So if anyone wants to see a lot of photos, you know, hundreds of them from the summer of 2020, check it out on Facebook, Cape Cod Camino Way Project. Uh, it's actually a closed group. Um, so that goes to the second part of your question, because I wanted to create a space where people who were exploring issues of race and social justice and to have it be, um, you know, safe in the terms of available for people to ask questions and receive feedback and support from each other as we were learning as opposed to a place where we were gonna debate and take on each other and try to prove who was right or who was wrong. I saw this as a learning opportunity and awareness building, both my own awareness and to share that with others. So that's why I created a closed Facebook group. And now we also have an open one that is still going. Um, so thank you for asking that. Uh, one question I have is encountering on these walks, did you find any parts that were not pedestrian friendly? Because I oh. feel like a lot of <laughs> most of the Cape is not yeah. pedestrian friendly. So, yes. So for about five miles um, on the Centerville down to Craigville Beach, that section had no sidewalks. And that was very challenging to, to walk on that. Uh, part of it was on Route 28 that had no sidewalks. Um, and then some other parts of Cape Cod, you know, more like you would expect up in Wellfleet or Truro on the back roads. But again, it made me, you know, stop and, and I'm, I'm an able bodied person who could, you know, navigate around these spaces. Um, but I would love to see more of Cape Cod be accessible um, to all types of mobility. Mm -hmm. And then another question I have is kind of more like in general about approaching this subject matter. Yeah. And how, how do you, how would you encourage people to keep uh, an open mind and kind of that like be open to new perspectives? Yeah, so so how I do that is to think about if we're going to take a trip somewhere, whether it's to go to Boston or go to another state or go to another country, we start with some idea of what we might want to see. And that usually involves, you might Google TripAdvisor or, you know, the typical places to go. So you get some ideas and you get some stories that you might want to investigate. And what I would encourage people to do is when we travel, even if it's to the town next door um, or further afield, we ask the question, whose story is not being told? Who's here that I need to learn about? Or who was here that I need to learn about? And where can I go find that? So some of that might be through the historical societies like Atwood and, or museums and others. Some of it might be through our libraries, which are fabulous resources. And a lot of it is through these organizations, like I mentioned, uh, that are all across Cape Cod that you can just go to their websites and then say, oh, wow, I didn't really know they had a separate, you know, uh, piece, all this information about women and people of color and science. And what did they do over in 
Falmouth and Woods Hole. Well, maybe I should go find out about that while I'm walking over there. And it's just amazing to me that whenever I ask the question, and you'll see it at the end when I, I get through, because I did a civil rights, civil war tour on my way back from Florida last year. And I'll show you a few examples of where that happened. Just because I asked, well, what else is here? Um, more stories came, came through to me. Awesome, thank you. So can Absolutely. we keep going or we I got another we question? Okay, great. Because no, that feeds right into the next uh, two walks. Um, the walk five was on uh, from Dennis on the bike path over to Chatham through Harwich. And that week we focused a lot on um, healthcare, mind, body, spirit, um, and how COVID was having a disproportionate impact on immune compromised people uh, and black indigenous and people of color. And then we also touched on the Cape Verdean influence on Cape Cod. And so we, I reached out to um, folks at Pilgrim's Landing in Chatham, which is an interspiritual center. And they are the ones who helped build and they take care of the labyrinth in Chatham, which is right next to the historic windmill. So many of you who are from Chatham, you've probably walked this labyrinth, which again is a, um, a, 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 a sort of pilgrimage and it's from the middle ages. It's found in uh, cathedrals all over the world, including a famous one at Chartres in uh, France. And so we had a program for us by Pilgrim's Landing at the labyrinth to really focus us on how are we feeling within our own bodies, within our own spirits, everything that we were learning? Because it was stirring up a lot of questions for us, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of, wow, I, I wish I could do more around um, issues of race and, and privilege and social justice. I also reached out to Dr. Kumara Siddhartha, who uh, is from Cape Cod Healthcare, Dr. Sid, as he is known locally. And his approach is that food is medicine and eating healthy supports all aspects of our health. And so we had conversations about who has access to good food, what happens uh, in socioeconomic depressed areas in cities in particular, that there's no grocery stores available. Um, and how that help, that that um, only having the choice of high calorie, low quality food then affects everything from weight to diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. So we took a look at that as we went through um, Chatham and Harwich. I did note in the book that I wrote after about all this that I returned, the Atwood Museum was closed when we went by um, because of COVID, but I was able to return um, a few weeks later, it was open on a Saturday. And I found that there was this outstanding exhibit about the Chatham connection to the Mayflower, which I had no idea about. And then I read all about it, that the Mayflower actually turned off the coast of Chatham uh, at Pollock's Rip and made the fateful turn up to P-Town. So that was very interesting. But what was also on the, on the wall at the Atwood was an exhibit about D-Day. And my father was in D-Day. He landed at Normandy Beach. And um, you know that's always been a very powerful place for me and thinking about, Nor about D-Day and what everyone experienced there. And in your exhibit was uh, a picture of Rosie the Riveter, but it was a black woman. And I had never seen a picture of Rosie the Riveter as a black woman. And so I went up to the desk and thanked whoever was there. And I just said, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but that is so powerful for me to see her on your wall and to know that there were women of color who worked building the planes 
uh, along with white women in the war. Um, so I was really happy to go back to the Atwood and, and see that. The sixth week and sixth walk was around the Cape Cod economy. And this was a really tough walk for me because I've owned property in Brewster for over 20 years. And I really did not understand the full connection of our sea captains to the triangle trade, the trade between New England, Africa, and the Caribbean, uh, or as they're called, the West Indies. And so what I was able to do on this walk was share what I had learned by interviewing people at the Brewster Historical Society, by interviewing um, other people who were critical of the, the typical narrative about the sea captains on Cape Cod. And we found examples in the cemeteries uh, behind the Unitarian Church in Brewster and on Lower Road where the sea captains died in Africa, Barbados, Havana, um, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, all during the time of the, um, uh, the triangle trade. And what was happening was these New England sea captains were, go, were bring, they were, um, they went to the west coast of Africa and some of them were involved in, in the actual uh, transportation of humans over to the West Indies who were sold there and they picked up the uh, sugar cane that then was brought to any, there were 40 or 50 different uh, distilleries between New York and uh, like um, New Bedford, especially around uh, Providence area, very heavy into making rum. And rum was the drink of the colonies. People didn't drink soda. They didn't drink uh, rum and beer, basically, is what, what people were drinking. And so we talked a lot about the, tr the triangle trade. And I really delved into the story of Elijah Cobb, the sea captain from Brewster, whose house is where the Brewster Historical Society is, is, is housed now. And so we had to think about how the economy of Brewster, the Cape and all the Northeast was so intertwined with the institution of slavery. We, we dried our salt cod to ship in barrels that were built here on ships that were built here to the Caribbean to feed the enslaved populations. Why? because it was cheaper to purchase this second grade salt cod than it was to grow vegetables and, and food on the islands. They wanted the island property to grow sugarcane to make money. I had never heard that before 2020. And then when you think about the institution of slavery in the South and how many of our sea captains they may not have gone to Africa, or they may not have even gone to the Caribbean, but they went to North Carolina, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, New Orleans, Biloxi, Mississippi. And what did they bring back with them to the textile mills in Lawrence and Lowell, et cetera, cotton. And our economy was driven by this, as well as many other you know, trade that went on between the North and the South. So it was a pretty tough week um, deconstructing all of this. And I was really glad that we had a group of people, about eight or 10 people who joined us. And we also, we started in Brewster and we walked through Orleans and all the way up to the Cape Cod National Seashore so we were able to dive in the water at the end of the day, and it was a good way to kind of restore our spirits and be thankful that this national seashore that President Kennedy had the foresight to, to put this together um, that we still in, enjoy today. 
The seventh walk was really looking at the influences of Black and Indigenous people of color on the arts. And so I asked everyone who I knew was coming with us that week, and there was about 10 people, to bring their favorite author, poet, musician, um, someone from a cultural background that was not theirs. And we shared those as we went along the way. And so we were able to see how people can influence our lives. Um, we, we read from Joy Harjo, H-A-R-J-O, who was the poet laureate uh, of the United States. And she has some fabulous poems, um, including one about the kitchen table that I would highly recommend, recommend you, you read. And then some people brought pictures on their, on their cell phones to show us of their favorite artwork, um, Frida Klein and uh, some Mexican artists that had been very influential for them. Our last walk took us through uh, starting at um, Truro and went through Truro uh, and all of Provincetown um, out through the forest to Herring Cove up and back around Commercial Street. And we wanted to do everything from look at the Mayflower and the Pilgrims, the artists and right, why did it become an artist colony and why, why, did the, why does the LGBTQ community feel so comfortable there and welcomed? And part of that is as, as the uh, executive director of the Tennessee Williams Fest Festival, Steve Kaplan, he jokes, part of the reason P-Town is the way it is today is because the pilgrims left and they went to Plymouth. They didn't stay. And so Pil Provincetown became this kind of, uh, um, it was so far, it was even physically disconnected back then, you know, by water, um, that it became a place where a lot of uh, outliers, basically, uh, people getting away from society would go there. And that's how it, we think of it today. And so these were the three or four walkers uh, with us th that day. Uh, we took a lot of stops um, at, this is the uh, town hall in Provincetown, which actually was a jail and famous people like Marlon Brando uh, ended up there, um, which is a whole nother story. But this is the AIDS Memorial in Provincetown, right across from the uh, Bas Relief Park, which is below the Pilgrim's Monument. And so we talked about what do all these things mean? What does, what does it mean to have the pilgrims right here in Provincetown being honored at the same time that an AIDS memorial? Uh, when you think back to the late 70s, early 80s, what was going on with AIDS, uh, Provincetown and New York City were the epicenters. And so uh, Provincetown did a fabulous job uh, getting through that pandemic. And as you can see, we're wearing our masks and we were still in the middle of a pandemic when this happened. So a few reflections um, that I'd like to share with you is I basically was trying to create opportunities for my own reflection, learning, action, and then integrating what I was learning. And by having the Facebook page I was trying to share it with other people. And so several hundred people connected with the walks via the Facebook page. I would ask what books or movies, mu music do I need to explore? I would really take the time to listen to people as we were walking um, and to ask about their stories. And that I would try to listen more and speak less. That was my motto for that summer. And for those people who know me, I speak a lot. So I really wanted to try to listen. And then how do I incorporate what I'm learning? And what do I do with it now? And I had to remain hopeful in the midst of everything that was going on in 2020, 2021, the election, the, you know, what happened on January 6th, I still tried to remain hopeful for where we were going. Those are just some quotes from people who came with us. 
So last winter, I said to myself, I can work part time online. Well, let me go rent a place in Florida and take all the notes that I have from my walks and create a book. And so I, I created a, a paperback book called the Cape Cod Camino Way. And it has a chapter on each of these walks that I mentioned to you. And then the last chapter of the book is I took two weeks coming back from Florida last April. So the first two weeks of April 21, I did a civil rights, civil war tour. And I started, I don't know if I have the map here. I think, I don't know, no, I don't. But I started in um, Mobile, Alabama, and then went to Birmingham. This is, uh, this is uh, the steps of the state house in Alabama, where Jefferson Davis, the first president of the Confederacy, still stands on the steps of the state house in Alabama. And you can see that it was a place, this was in Mobile, uh, where the slave markets were. And this is a picture of Gettysburg. And so I went all the way from Alabama through Tennessee. I stopped in parts of North Carolina. I went to Cherokee, North Carolina, where the Cherokee Native American tribe was rounded up and walked a thousand miles called the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. They were displaced and they are still to this day on an Indian reservation in Oklahoma. I then continued through Virginia and I saw the um, monuments that were being taken down to some of the civil rights, uh, civil war leaders. I stopped at Washington and Lee and actually I think I have a picture of that. Yeah, this right here is a list of the enslaved people who were sold and the money taken to found Washington and Lee University. That was just amazing to me that this was on the, the steps of the administration building. And then this is a picture uh, in Birmingham. If you think back to the days of uh, Bull Connor, the sheriff unleashing his dogs. So this was a, um, you know, a display, a monument uh, showing the terror um, that black and white people who were protesting segregation at that time had to go through. And so doing this civil rights, civil war tour for two weeks last year goes to that question of just how do we need to look at what we're seeing differently? And what questions can I ask when I'm when I am somewhere. So when I was here at Gettysburg, I asked my Airbnb owner, well, could you tell me anything about the black experience at Gettysburg? And she said, oh, you have to go with my husband tomorrow. He'll take you to the black cemetery. So the, every single one of these headstones of union soldiers and monuments, there's hundreds of them these monuments are all to the white soldiers. There is a separate black cemetery in Gettysburg that has the headstones partially fallen down. It's barely kept up. And again, to me, it was just an amazing thing to see in the midst of honoring the Union soldiers that we still have not properly accounted for the black soldiers who fought also in that cause. And so the work continues. Um, as I said, I wrote the book and then last summer I decided to offer the walks again, but to shorten them to two miles. So I offered walks in Brewster and in Provincetown. Last summer I had about 300 different people walk with me at some point. And this summer, what I'm planning to do is offer a walk in Brewster, maybe Provincetown, and then the, I'm gonna offer one with the JFK Museum in Hyannis every, uh, I think Wednesday or Friday. And we're gonna walk and weave into the story 
the Zion Union Heritage Museum, uh, things like the Peace Corps and Special Olympics that the Kennedys were involved in. So lots, I still have to explore more about uh, Hyannis and Barnstable. But that's my story. And I'm happy to continue to engage and hear what your thoughts are. Was there any place in particular that touched you that you want to go back and explore more of maybe in the future? I put my website there so that if any of you are interested in receiving a copy of the book, you can order it through there. I might, when I get back in uh, early May, I'll drop a few copies off at the Atwood Museum too, so they can have some. And my email address is there. So that if, if you're putting together a walk for your family or friends and you just want a few ideas of you know, different options uh, on Cape Cod, I'm happy to answer a question um, or a comment from there. So as I say, keep walking and keep learning. So let's hear any other questions, comments, thoughts. Well, one question was, will the book be on sale? So we answered that one. Uh, one question I have is, and I think we talked about it in our run through was on your talks, you may have the, I, the history you were presenting or exploring may have made people feel uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. I think you talked about one person, you know, okay, let's, you think back to your ancestry and what does that mean and how did that inform you? So what were some instances mm -hmm. like that that came up on the walk? Sure, yes. And that's part of my goal is to make this an experiential activity that is as comfortable as possible for people to explore and go deeper. And, you, and even though they may feel a little discomfort at times, like I did sometimes learning things I just didn't know about. So what I do is, let's say there's 10 of us starting a walk. I ask everybody, well, where are you from? And not just the town that you come from, but where are your ancestors from? Because all of us are from somewhere else. And we hear everything from, you know, you know, England, Ireland, South Africa, whatever. Um, well, one time a friend of mine, her husband shared, well, I'm actually, my relatives are from Nova Scotia and they were the Tories who had to leave here because the, you know, they sided with England <laughs> and, um, they didn't feel real comfortable with the American Revolution. And, um, and he works at the Reagan Library. And so we had a really good discussion about how his experience at the Reagan Library, interacting with people all over the world, he can help share the story of America maybe a little broader than just what um, was the story that could be found in just Ronald Reagan's life story. And so I was asking him to consider, well, how do you weave in the stories of women or people of color or the Native American story that might connect with the Reagan story? Mm -hmm. And so that led, led to a really good discussion there. Um, I haven't, I haven't had any true like hostility situation happen. I'd say it's been more, um, a little bit of silence, a little bit of people once, once you feel uncomfortable. But again, I try to do it in a way that I'm not um, criticizing or judging how we've been educated because we all have been educated within a certain system. You know, we all had certain textbooks that just didn't tell us anything. I remember reading Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee in seventh grade and being completely flabbergasted, breaking down crying because of the stories I was hearing about what we did to the Native Americans. Um, and I went home and talked about it and my parents didn't know anything about this. Mm. They, they, they had never read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. They had barely heard anything about the Native Americans except what we typically think about for Thanksgiving. So 
I think as long as we continue to be willing to accept that there's things that we just don't know, and maybe once we become aware of them, it'll cause us to like reorient ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit what's uncomfortable right now in our society, because there's so much reorienting going on. And then you throw social media on top of it. And then you throw a pandemic on top of it. And now we have war going on, you know, in Ukraine and Russia, and we're hoping that it doesn't expand to World War III. So we're all in a really pretty tense, you know, place, which is why I would encourage people to stay local if you can, explore your, your own backyard mm -hmm. and get out in nature and see what's there go to a go to an, a museum or an organization and be able to interact with people who are a little different than you and i can guarantee you you're going to learn something from it one question it kind of goes back to the story about being followed they they really want to know where where was that and did you ever find out who those people were yeah sure um so it turns out it was um some guys who were part of a landscape company uh, working for, you know, one of the kind of wealthy homeowners right there. And that was a section of, um, I believe it was Centerville. It was either Osterville or Centerville, um, you know, all kind of gated homes. Um, and maybe to be fair to them, we looked, you know, we, we looked like a group of people taking a break, standing in somebody's driveway. Mm. That's one way to kind of give them some credit for maybe they were trying to do their job to ask the question, what are you doing here? You know, my brother, a white male, a white male married to a woman from Trinidad and having a seven year old daughter who looks dark, had to think he, his mind went to they're asking why we're here because there's people of color with us. That may or may not have been their intention, but that's how it was felt to my brother and my sister-in-law. And then later that day, one of the people at the um, Zion Union Heritage Museum used the N-word in her description of her artwork she was using it appropriately to tell her story because it was her uh, biracial son who was called the N-word, but she used it publicly. And my sister-in-law had never had the conversation yet with the seven-year-old niece of what the N-word was and what did it mean. So that became... It seemed to my sister-in-law and to me a little presumptuous for a white woman to tell a story mm. with the N-word in it when there were people of color sitting in the audience. Mm -hmm. So we, the positive that came from that was it gave our family an opportunity to discuss when or when or when is it okay or when is it not okay to say that we had never talked about that yeah yeah as a family i personally would not use the full word i've been in higher education for 40 years i might have gotten fired if i had used it in some places right mm -hmm. yeah so that was really interesting and just like totally unexpected something that happened along the way that is, thank you. Uh, right now, I don't see any other questions. It's Actually, if you don't mind, John, I'm just gonna chime in with a question just because I sure. can't see the type sure. one in, uh, on the uh, Q&A. Um, so Peggy, I noticed on some of the pictures you had a lot of young children on through your walks. How was the experience for them? I mean, did they ask questions or was it more of, they just felt like they were on a, you know, a, a long walk or? Yeah, we had a couple of interesting uh, combinations of people we had um, a grandmother and her granddaughter on three walks. 
And that was very powerful because we got to see things intergenerationally from their perspectives, everything from women in science to, you know, uh, black and indigenous um, artists. So we had some conversation that way. And then we had a group of high school students with us from Falmouth High School who they interacted with us in a kind of a career mentoring perspective. And, um, you know, we're telling some funny story, funny, but also a little bit sad in some ways, stories about how still in the classroom they were being ignored. And when the, when the boys were giving the wrong answer in their physics class or whatever, um, and the women scientists were just encouraging them, you know, well, make sure your voices are heard and you deserve to be right and um, volunteer for every experiment, you know, don't, don't, don't hold back. So there was some nice interaction give and take there. And I did have one student, one high school student do her own um, Instagram about everything because I, I could only handle so much media being of a certain generation, social media. So she did the Instagram account and would interact with people that way. So that was really a nice, a nice way to include them and their skill set, you know, into this. Um, I am putting together uh, something for uh, Barnstable High School. I need to get back in touch with their history teacher and we might do a separate walk for, for them. Thank you. When you yeah. went on uh, on some of these, uh, all these different locations, was there a, a certain aha moment that you had really, wow, I really didn't know that about the history of this as it ties into uh, social justice or whatever the case may be? Hmm. God, there were so many aha moments. It's, it's hard to pick uh, any particular one. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use the one... Um, I don't know if you can hear in the background, I have a helicopter going above me right now. Um, I'll use the one uh, that connects with the Atwood Museum. Um, so that summer, I don't, do you still have the We Too outside? Of yeah, the Atwood, we do. Atwood? We do. Okay. So, um, you know, watching that get built and then reading about the story of the, you know, the, um, I'm blanking on his name, Whedon. David Whedon. David Whedon, who built it. And then, you know, seeing um, that kind of emerge and then watching him and others become more central to the exhibits, everything from the Pilgrim, the Provincetown Museum exhibit in your area over to the Mashpee, uh, the Wellfleet Historical Society, everything was getting kind of redone because of the Mayflower 400, you know, the Pilgrim 400 sure. thing. And I loved the centering of the Native American voices into all of this, because it just seems like they had been erased for the most part. Um, so that was a that was pretty big for me. Excellent. That's the only question I had. John, anything else? Um, I think that was great. I okay. we don't have any more questions. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Thank you everyone for joining me on a walk around Cape Cod and uh, hope to see you on a walk some someday. And feel free to reach out if you have a question or comment once you take a look at the book too. So thank you so much. And thank you to the Atwood for sponsoring this tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. That was okay. very informative. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. All righty. Good night, everyone. <laughs>